welcome everybody to tonight's panel. Give me freedom or give me the rope, piracy and liberty by the sea. I'm Lou Rocco, the visitor experience manager here at Revolutionary Spaces, and I'm delighted to be moderating uh, tonight's program. Tonight, we're gonna be walking the plank with three esteemed historians who are gonna help us understand the weird and wild world of colonial era piracy. We're gonna be diving, delving deep into Davy Jones's locker to uncover the basics and finer details of life under the black flag and the relationship between the American colonies and the pirates. It should be a freebooting good time, but we'll see. And with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guests who I am humbled and honored to be with tonight. Megan Victor is an anthropologist who specializes in historical archeology span from the 17th through the 19th centuries. In particular, they're interested in commensal politics, drinking spaces, trade and exchange, informal economies, and gendered spaces. Dr. Victor has worked extensively on the archeology span of the English colonial world in North America, including excavations at the fishing village and trading post on Smutty Nose Island within the Isle of Shoals in Maine, Virginia's colonial capital of Williamsburg, including the 18th century Raleigh Tavern, a favorite of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, and sites throughout 17th and 18th century Chesapeake Bay. It is within the Atlantic world, in the English colonial world, that much of their current research takes place in the form of the Molly House Project. Uh, the other geographic focus of Dr. Victor's research is that of the American West, with an eye to the mining frontiers of the 19th century. And it is in with, uh, within this space that their second ongoing research project, the Highland City Project, takes place. Dr. Victor received their BA in anthropology from the University of Michigan in 2010, their master's in 2012, and their PhD in 2018, both of those latter degrees from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Dr. Victor is currently an assistant professor at Queens College, CUNY. Dr. Victor, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next, we have Stephen O'Neill. He is the executive director of the Hanover Historical Society. Uh, in 2019, he was the guest curator for the archaeology exhibit In Small Things Remembered at the Alden House Historic Site in Duxbury, and in 2021, authored the accompanying catalog, Alden Archaeology, Exhibiting the Daily Lives of a Mayflower Family. In 2018, O'Neill was the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities funded scholar in residence at the Old Colony History Museum in Taunton. He was senior lecturer in history at Suffolk University in Boston, where he taught a very popular course on the history of piracy, which I was fortunate enough to take during my time at Suffolk University. He was formerly the associate director and curator of collections at Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth. In 2012, he contributed the essay Caribbean Buccaneers in New England to New England and the Caribbean the 2008 Dublin Seminar Annual Proceedings. O'Neill has curated more than 20 temporary exhibitions and was guest curator for the 1999 exhibit, Putting uh, Pirates on Trial in Puritan Boston, right here at the Old State House, uh, and for the 2006 exhibit, A Short Life and Merry Pirates of New England at the Heritage Museums and Garden in Cape Cod. He has lectured widely on Plymouth Colony and pirate history and has led tours of many burying grounds and cemeteries Stephen, good to see you again, of course, and thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Lou. Uh, and finally, we have Rebecca Simon, a historian of modern early piracy, uh, colonial America, the Atlantic world, and maritime history. She earned her PhD from King's College London in 2017. Her dissertation, entitled The Crimes of Piracy and Its Punishment, The Performance of Maritime Supremacy in the British Atlantic World, 1670 to 1830, examines British maritime and legal supremacy in its early American colonies in regards to maritime piracy. Her first book, Why We Love Pirates, The Hunt for Captain Kidd and How He Changed Piracy Forever, discusses transformation of real pirates during the golden age of piracy from their authentic historical selves into pop culture phenomena today. She has appeared on many podcasts, including You're Dead to Me, hosted by Greg Jenner, History Hit by Dan Snow, and Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness. She's been featured on the Netflix docudrama, The Lost Pirate Kingdom, the BBC Four documentary, Britain's Outlaws, and the History Channel shows The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond Oak, I uh, Beyond Oak Island. Rebecca, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, to our Motley crew in the audience here this evening, if you'd like to ask any questions of our panelists, you may do so uh, by using uh, the chat feature here this evening. We'll do our best to get to them uh, as many as we can. So we got a lot of questions here uh, uh, to get through a lot of subjects I'd like to cover. So I want to start with something basic, but something really foundational. And Rebecca, we'll start with you here. So we're going to talk about pirates a lot tonight, but let's start with something very basic. When we use that word pirate, what exactly and who exactly are we referring to? And how are pirates different from different categories of people like, say, buccaneers or privateers? 
Thank you so much. So the legal definition of piracy in terms of the golden age of piracy in the 17th and the 18th century were those who robbed and murdered on a body of water. And this could be according to the Admiralty Courts, those in charge of anything maritime, lakes, streams, oceans, and of course, rivers and the sea. Now, these people are different than other terms we may have heard of, such as buccaneers or privateers. So buccaneers were really common in the 17th century, and most of them were French pirates or sort of pirates. And they mostly were targeting Spanish ships because the Spanish ships had been harassing them in lots of their own islands, such as on Tortuga. It's interesting. They were also known as buccaneers because they spent a lot of time on land and they roasted meat, which comes from a term, French term boucanier. So that's kind of how they got that nickname. Now, privateer seems very similar to a pirate, but the key difference is that they have a contract called a letter of mark which is from a government basically hiring them to attack specific enemy ships during a specific period of time, usually during times of war or some other conflict. So as um, and privateers, the way they are paid is they're able to keep about 80% of their loot and about 20% of that will go back to the government. So it's really lucrative for them. They're basically mercenaries. And once the letter of mark expires, then they can no longer be privateers. If they continue, this is when they become known as a pirate. And the term pirate is also interesting because it becomes quite convoluted as the 18th century continues to go on until it re refers to anyone who's just harassing people at sea. So it's a very interesting term. Excellent. So it seems like there's a, sort of a chronological distinction in terms of maybe the, the difference between buccaneers and pirates, and then, of course, the legal distinction between privateers and pirates. But I, I believe uh, as well, there are some other terms um, before the panel started. Uh, Megan, you mentioned that there were perhaps some other terms that uh, are maybe fine distinctions or broad distinctions as well uh, that might be helpful to clarify. So go for it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Hopefully the sound is good. Perfect. Yeah, so just a few other ones that I definitely had wanted to, to get into. Um, in addition, one of the terms plays off of this term privateer. So again, yes, a privateer was sort of a pirate for hire, right, working under this letter of mark. And another term that's often heard is corsair, uh, especially in connection with the Barbary Coast. And so initially, these were used to refer to any privateer that the French government had issued a letter of mark to. And so this was initially just the French word for privateer, but it later began to refer to sort of any pirates or privateers who were operating in the Mediterranean, uh, still during the golden age of piracy though, and especially into the 18th century, because we end up seeing these hubs of activity shifting from the Spanish main into the Mediterranean, into off the coast of Madagascar, as people keep looking for places where they can get the richest treasure ships with the least resistance. Because one of the big things about piracy is that piracy itself flourishes most in waters that are inadequately policed or on coasts where there's not a lot of pushback. And we still see that today because pirates still exist today. And so, especially though for colonial America, for the 18th century, and sort of the tail end of the 17th century, that's really where it matters. If you have something that's heavily policed, you're not gonna be a very successful pirate. And then the final term that I wanted to point out, because it's one that we hear all the time when we talk about romanticizing pirates or we look at pirate films or things like that is the term swashbuckler, because it's gone through its own really interesting evolution. And in the 16th century, which is actually really before we get to a lot of what we would think of as sort of the golden age of piracy or pirates heyday. Um, it was a word that was used to talk about a brigand or an outlaw, but specifically one that was on land. And then by the 17th century, so this would be sort of that tail end is now the golden age of piracy. It referred to a swordsman and granted certain types of swords were used in boarding parties by pirates. But it wasn't until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that it was at all applied to pirates so long after the golden age of piracy ended when they were looking for a way to describe someone who was sort of heroic and dashing and yet also was wielding a sword. And they looked back to the 17th century term for swordsmen that had had this earlier connotation of lawlessness. And they thought, well, that looks sexy. 
And so they used it in Penny Dreadfuls and they used it in novels. And then Hollywood said, yeah, I actually really love this idea. And Hollywood ran with the term swashbuckler and used it in all of their videos. And so we now think of that, but it actually was never used in any sort of legal documents at all to apply to anything relating to pirates. Excellent. Uh, great. Thank you, Megan, as well there. Um, Stephen, just want to check in to see if there are any other terms or anything you would add to that first question before we move on. Well, just to amplify um, what Rebecca and Megan were just talking about, piracy is essentially a, a very simple crime. It's the theft of portable wealth traveling by water. Uh, and it has existed since ancient times all around the world. Wherever there's a choke point, where valuable goods are traveling uh, by ship. Uh, so you find it in Homeric Greece, you find it in the Roman Empire, you find it today in various choke points around the world. Um, but what's interesting is piracy, like Megan alluded to, um, you know, took on this sort of fascination that people had with it. And this has existed for centuries. Um, you know, even in the 15, 1600s and 1700s, while the pirates were sailing, people were fascinated with them. Um, you know, so there's the pirates are never just common criminals. There's something a little more uh, about them uh, that leads to this romanticization with novels, with plays, with Peter Pan, with Pirates of the Caribbean, with all of these elements, you know, I've got the Lego pirate ship downstairs. Um, all of that comes from these basically criminals, these, these thugs, as Megan mentioned. So one of the things to keep in mind is when we look at piracy, who were these people? Who were these men and handful of women who turned pirate, you know, and trying to think of why? Why did they do this? Was it just economics? Was it just social? You know, all of these wonderful sort of mysteries about these people is what fascinates, I think, all of us. And that, Stephen, I think is an excellent segue into our next question, which is precisely about those motivations and trying to figure out and understand what motivated the men and women who decided to become pirates and live life under the black flag. So and I'm sort of interested as well in hearing, you know, each of you speak about the kinds of experiences perhaps those who became pirates would have uh, had in 17th and 18th century colonial societies that would have maybe pushed them into that life. Um, so whoever wants to sort of talk maybe about motivations and experiences uh, that would have pushed them that life. Uh, Megan, why don't, you, yeah, why don't you start us off with that one? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So there's quite a few different motivations, if you will, but the main thing that really needs to be, be borne out here are the experiences that are sort of taking place in the 17th and 18th century that would help to motivate someone to do it. And this is the fact that there is often a great social disruption that's taking place at sort of the tail end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century. And this is driving people in essence to a life of piracy. It isn't just oh, shiny, I'm going to go off to it, because there's a lot that goes into this. And it, it this is a time period where a lot of people didn't travel very far beyond their own home. This is a lifetime commitment if you're going to all of a sudden decide that you're going to be on the other side of the law. This is the same world where when you want to learn a trade, you usually enlist into a, a seven-year apprenticeship. So that's a very different lifestyle from I'm just going to go off to sea and become a pirate. So there had to be some really strong motivator to get someone to do this. But when you think about the fact that in England, for example, a lot of small farmers were driven off their lands by a combination of poor management and greedy landowners, and that small traders, small merchants, likewise were threatened by these sort of ever expanding large businessmen. And this is sort of the beginning of what we kind of start to see as, as corporations or sort of an anthropology and archeology. span we, we see this as one of the haunts of the modern era. This is to be early modern era. And this is sort of the very roots of mercantilism and capitalism starting to rear its head. And people are literally getting displaced financially. And so they're getting displaced physically. And so a lot of them flee to the cities like London, for example. But when they get there, London is terribly overcrowded. There's very few jobs and less support for the poor. So left to fend for themselves with absolutely no hope for the future, there's a couple of options. There's the Navy with questionable chances of upward promotion, questionable chances of any sort of 
success or, or working conditions, but at least perhaps you could send something to your family. Or there's the option of piracy. And so often one of the big motivators is this great social distress that's happening. And there's no shock then that so many individuals either jump ship from navies having taken that position because they did that so they weren't stuck in seaports or come from seaports themselves before going into piracy. They're looking for some sort of better opportunity than starving to death on land. And so much of what pirates rob, we, we are you know absolutely obsessed with the treasure ships and they certainly did. But so much of what they rob is also subsistence-based. They're robbing food, they're robbing alcohol, they're robbing things that will allow them to then rob another ship. So and I see Stephen um, nodding here, so. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly it sounds like not unlike um, uh, we, we've seen throughout history, uh, great social change and lack of economic support forces people into lives of uh, what is deemed criminal activity, but because they seem to think that perhaps there's no uh, no alternative or viable alternative to them. Stephen, that, Rebecca, anything else there on the motivations bit that you'd like to add? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Megan covered so much of it already. And um, I apologize if I'm accidentally repeating any information. <laughs> but I think what's also quite interesting is that a lot of people were quite motivated um, for piracy because many of the people who did just didn't have very many other options. And so this is why we might get some, uh, some enslaved people might enter a pirate ship, although that was actually very rare um, and a very complicated uh, situation as well. There's also the argument that there may have been cruel treatment on merchant ships, naval ships, uh, about perhaps withheld wages, or the fact that sailors didn't really have any real autonomy, couldn't make decisions, were on a pirate ship you could. Uh, the vast majority of people, though, who joined piracy were those who were forced into it, although um, many of them claim they weren't. But if it was able to be proven that they did actually take goods from when they plundered ships, that automatically qualified them legally as being pirates. So whether or not they were forced to take those goods to accept the goods um, or not, that's a big way how they might be counted as pirates. So it's really interesting kind of reading through trial transcripts and seeing like what people say, what their excuses are uh, and everything like that, but a huge myriad of reasons for people to become pirates. Excellent. Um, yeah, Stephen, sorry, go ahead. No, it's also, um, remember most pirates uh, with you know few exceptions, were coming from the maritime world. They were sailors, they were carpenters, they were fishermen. These are dangerous jobs. Uh, you know, if you are lucky enough to be a fisherman or a sailor, the blue water sailors, the deep Atlantic sailors, and make it to be an old man of 52 like me, you've lost arms, you've, you've lost eyes, you, you probably don't have many teeth left. It is a tough life. And one of the things that has always struck me, particularly, uh, Rebecca mentioned the, the court records, where they list out the names and ages and where the men are from. There's a certain fatalism, I think. You know, they know they're not going to last very long. Sailors are facing harsh conditions. Um, if you've ever been out in a little boat in a big storm, you can imagine what that would be like in the 17th century, you know, before GPS, before, you know, a, a lot of the... Um, uh, technology we have now. So I think a lot of this is they know they're not going to live very long. So why not take the chance when you have it, become a pirate, at least for a few years, you know, a short life in Mary, as um, Bart Roberts said, you might have good money, good food, all the alcohol you could possibly drink, um, a temporary companion, shall we say, the, those few physical pleasures that would be denied most of your, your working career. Uh, so this is one of the motivations that I've always thought was behind why these people became pirates. Excellent, I, th I think you've all provided uh, a, a great broad, broad side, if you will, of sort of the various motivations that would push these men and women to this life. And so I wanna sort of pivot now into what that life was maybe perhaps actually like uh, for those who, who were pirates and specifically to try to understand how life on pirate ships, economically, socially, culturally, politically, how those may have contrasted with life in colonial society, perhaps especially uh, English colonial society, which was a bit more structured, a bit more hierarchical and rigid. 
Um, what, what kind of uh, really obvious and maybe nuanced differences uh, would we have seen between those pirate uh, cultures and colonial culture? Yeah. I'll go ahead and I'll try to start answering this question. Um, so you're asking about like uh, the differences between kind of pirate culture and their relationships to colonial culture, um, just, just to clarify. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting because there was a period of time, especially in around the turn of the 18th century, late 17th turn of the 18th century, where there were a lot of colonial communities, especially in the Caribbean, that actually had pretty interesting relationships with pirates. They could bring in goods because of the Navigation Acts, which blocked trade from British colonists and British colonies from pretty much any other non-British colony. And this was to cripple European economies from competitors like the Spanish. And so you actually did have an interesting relationship of pirates bringing in goods from all these other countries. And so there were certain places that local governors or officials were writing to the Admiralty, re referring to places like Rhode Island or Philadelphia as nests of pirates or a new Jamaica, because Jamaica had been a pirate haven in the 17th century. But then it's really, um, at the turn of the 18th century, when the British really start cracking down and they tell the colonists, you have to start trying pirates with the laws of England. And up until then, the colonists were left alone. They had their own laws, especially in places like Virginia. And so this actually caused like a huge change in terms of the colonial relationship to piracy. Now, this is very different from, I'm talking mostly about the, I should reiterate, mostly the mid-Atlantic down to the Caribbean. New England is very different being kind of a Puritan uh, Puritan region and also very maritime based economies. Um, and so piracy was more of a danger. And also there was kind of like a religious attitude um, against sailors because sailors were seen as being quite irreligious, especially pirates. So that's where you have, you know, I can go on and on and I don't want to because I want others to speak to. Um, but this is where we have people like Cotton Mather coming out to really kind of try to condemn pirates. And so the relationship between kind of colonists and pirates is so multifaceted, but people are also so fascinated by pirates because they were seen as agents of social change in a way. Pirates, if they got wealthy, could kind of transcend into a different social station, technically, economically speaking, whereas nobody on land could. It wasn't really possible during that time, but I will yield to the floor. <laughs> Rebecca, you mentioned the religious dimension up here in New England. Of course, Boston, you know, with its with its very literate um, society up here, um, Cotton Mather published not only preached but published the execution sermons. The trial transcripts were published uh, for you know starting with Quelch in 1704. The transcript of Quelch was the first American trial where the full transcript was published. Um, it was published in London. Uh, Governor Dudley, you know, said that he had it published, quote, to quiet the clamor of a rude people. So you've got this combination of the authorities trying to crack down on pirates, but you also have this religious dimension uh, where Cotton Mather would drag the, the condemned pirates into the meeting house and then accompany them to the place of execution, preaching all the while, um, insufferable as he was. Um, but it's an extraordinary sort of way that he used it because he understood people were fascinated with these crimes. So he knew that if he published these little sermons and their small little books, they would sell and they would be read um, by everyone in the community and also by other sailors. Go ahead, Megan. Well, it's very dear to my own heart too. So I'm so glad you brought up that example because I was like, raring to bring it up. Uh, Part of the reason Quilch is very dear to my heart is that uh, one of the sites that I excavated on the Isles of Shoals actually gave shelter to John Quilch for quite some time, along with Ter uh, Thomas Larimer of the Larimer Galley. But John Quilch hid out there uh, both while he was recruiting off of Marblehead and then later on when he was sort of when they had revoked his letter of mark and declared him a pirate. And so sort of a before and after, if you will, he hit out on Smutty Nose Island, notably in and among the taverns there, and we excavated the tavern. And so it was a really neat way to sort of test, if you will, for the, these markers of, can we see pirates in the archeological record when we know that we have pirates that set foot here, and especially pirates that made themselves so well known as 
yes, this is what I did. Yes, I had a letter of mark. Yes, it was sort of pulled away from me and then I was branded a pirate. And I went through this whole very public trial as, as John Quelch did. Um, and so he, he definitely remains a very central figure sort of the history of the Shoals because while he wasn't tried at the Isle of Shoals, he was certainly there for quite some time. And he even pulled several Shoalers into his crew. And the Shoalers ended up sort of, when they eventually were evacuated from the Isles of Shoals uh, during the American Revolution, largely because they were smuggling arms to both sides on the conflict. Um, and so both sides of the conflict, oddly enough, agreed on one thing, and it was to get rid of the Shoalers. Um, and so when they were there, they actually became some of the really prominent families of, of Maine and things like that. There are these rumors, right, that some of them served alongside Larimer, served alongside Quelch, uh, but not all of them, obviously, were caught or anything like that, whereas Quelch certainly very publicly was. Uh, but it's neat to see we do have some very strange outliers, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect even in a pretty wealthy tavern. And it just makes you wonder, are these the hints that Quelch was walking in this tavern? And, and pivoting now, <laughs> For a moment, to, uh, uh, there, there, there are two questions in the chat that kind of go together. I think that'd be good to get uh, some answers on from, from the panel, which is uh, very simply, uh, logistically speaking, how were pirate crews constructed? How were they built? And how did they come about uh, the ships that they would use? Uh, perhaps at least the ones that they initially set sail on. Perhaps we can guess as to why or how they, they, they uh, gathered ships over time, but uh, how were pirate crews built and how do they sort of get their ships to start? Uh, Stephen, how about you start us off on that one? Sure. Uh, pirate crews could be started, one, through a mutiny, uh, such as Henry Avery uh, in the 1690s, uh, or it could be that you are captured by pirates and the pirate crew comes aboard and asks who would like to join. Who will sign the articles and be a member of the Brotherhood, um, and that you know is is common with the the sort of free association buccaneers of the 1660s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, you know the the Bartholomew Sharp group that went into the Pacific, uh, and also that last generation, the generation of the Jolly Roger, the 17 teens and 20s. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, well for our pirates, but, um, you know, more and more forced men, people who were um, useful, such as carpenters or surgeons or navigators, would be held on board a ship as not a full member of the crew, but at least have the freedom of the deck. Um, so that is how the crews, the pirate crew sort of was formed. The ships, the technology is, is extraordinary. A lot of times they'll start off with a very small vessel, a sloop or a catch, and move up to a larger vessel. Uh, sometimes they'll, the vessel will be too large, such as Blackbeard's Queen Anne's Revenge, so they'll trade down to a smaller uh, sloop, where sloops um, and schooners were fast, designed for speed, which went along with the, the tactics pirates have, using lightning fast approach, terror as a weapon, grab whatever's portable wealth and leave quickly. So the, the combination of how the crew is formed plus the technology of the ships at the time really sort of helped create you know, how these pirates uh, sailed, how they acted, how they, how they were successful or not successful at the time. And as we've sort of touched upon uh, a little earlier here, I think Rebecca, you mentioned it that uh, occasionally or perhaps frequently, um, pirate crews would come across ships that were carrying uh, human cargo as well. Yes. And so I'd be, I'd really be curious to hear from uh, all of you, what was that interaction like between pirate crews and the transatlantic slave trade? Was there sort of a, uh, maybe not a uniform policy since pirates weren't necessarily that coordinated, but was there kind of a, a consistent uh, approach when pirate crew would come across uh, enslaved people on ships, or did it vary from ship to ship? Any interesting stories or uh, specific instances in there, I think uh, our audience would love to hear. Yeah, so there um, were a lot of it. So it really kind of depended ship to ship. Um, people are there exploring kind of the connection between piracy and the slave trade is kind of like a growing subject amongst um, pirate historians. It's a little difficult to kind of find that information, but more and more research is coming out about it. Now, 
pirates, when they robbed ships, um, I've just um, been researching loads about kind of pirates looting and getting goods and everything like that. Human cargo was treated as cargo for the most part. If there were enslaved people on a ship, um, they were often, usually if it was a small amount, they were often counted as cargo. And for the most part, they would not get absorbed into the crew. Now, there were some pirates, such as Edward Teach, commonly known as Blackbeard, who did capture the ship La Concorde and actually did absorb loads of enslaved people into his crew. However, he did end up selling the majority of them when they arrived in the Caribbean. So there's kind of this idea that pirates are very altruistic and would kind of bring in enslaved people and that these ships became almost kind of like these utopias for every marginalized folk. Not really so, um, because many enslaved people were seen as cash grabs. And so when people would look at like, um, you know, again, in the trial transcripts and other reports, there would be a list of pilfered goods that pirates had stolen. And many, almost every single one I looked at usually included the mention of um, an enslaved person. So there definitely was this connection. Now, in terms of how significant piracy was against the slave trade, that I'm not quite sure yet. I don't know, maybe um, Megan or Stephen know more about that than me. Um, but that I think is a really interesting kind of new idea that we're really get diving into, no pun intended. I'm happy to weigh in just a bit. Um, it is very true that as much as we sort of talk about these, uh, you know, these pirate ships as, as having a code, and I'm happy to sort of go into that, that next or something, that prejudice was prejudice, right? And that people still certainly were informed by the prejudices of their time. And so while we have evidence of things like Black Bart, right, Bartholomew Roberts uh, has several pieces of evidence that he had um, individuals who were either former slaves or were French Creole. So at least somewhere in, in their, their family, there had been slaves as a part of his ship, an equal part of his ship. This actually seems to be something more of an outlier, and this was about 1721, so this is getting toward the end of that golden age of piracy, sort of, if you will. Anyways, it's uh, it's really much more romantic uh, in a lot of the sort of present day things where we're trying to show pirates as the great equalizers and, and these great floating republics, when the most of what we end up seeing again and again is that either people these pirates were taking slaves and then immediately going out and selling them. They were taking them and they were selling them as brides so that local governors wouldn't notice this happened, especially if they were raiding off the coast of Africa. So often they would do it to allow English governors to look the other way. They'd be like, look, we'll give you this. It's like we were never here and it worked. Uh, or, you know, as early as like the 1680s, we have evidence of the fact that they would outfit their ships like uh, William Dampier in 1681 he sets off to sea and he's got he makes a really big deal about the fact that he has indigenous men and they're armed to the teeth and he has white men and they're armed to the teeth and he has five slaves and their job is to keep the ship running and clean and captain kidd was notorious for using slaves for heavy labor except when he could find cheaper labor from elsewhere um and what that means is suspicious uh and it seems to be whenever he could find someone that was able to be captured and used like a slave. And so it, it's just really important to note that, you know, pirates didn't really disrupt the slave trade in the way that you might think of, oh, wow, they're disrupting the slave trade by stopping it. They were disrupting its profits uh, by taking them for their own, but they weren't actually disrupting the movement of human cargo. And in fact, there's a complaint in Jamaica in 1724 so again, if you look at that example that I gave earlier, Black Bar, you think, okay, well, that's why it's getting toward the end. But likewise, a bunch of merchants in Jamaica, they complain back to London and they say, you have to do something about these pirates because they're causing absolute havoc and destruction, they say, of the very ships employed in the trade on which our colonies chiefly depend and the colonies trade is the slave trade. Um, and in fact, there's another version of it that expressly refers to it as the slave trade um, and another complaint out there. So they're not talking about rum or sugar or anything else. They're talking about the fact that these pirates are specifically targeting slave ships because that's where the money is. 
I think it's also um, important to remember that the, the pirates are men of their time um, and handful of women. I can't forget Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, um, but they are people of their time. Some you know, view the enslaved people as just cattle, as you know, property. Others, maybe they're a little bit more favorable uh, in their attitudes towards Africans or people of mixed ethnicity. Um, Megan, you mentioned Bart Roberts when he was finally defeated on the coast of Africa, off, um, off the coast of Africa in 1722. You know, it was, was because of this exaggerated threat that Roberts and others were disrupting the slave trade, that they were disrupting uh, the various ships coming out of the slaving stations. And when he was captured, Roberts and his, well, Roberts was killed in the engagement, but his crew was put on trial. All of the white pirates were put on trial, uh, but 25% of his crew, over 70, were in some way, shape, or form um, you know, members of the crew, but they were black. And unfortunately, where the white pirates, they have their names and ages and origins listed, for the black pirates, they're just lumped together, you know, sold back to the Royal Africa Company. In some of the transcripts, the trial transcripts, like Rebecca mentioned, you know, you sometimes get witness testimony from some of the black or multi-ethnic um, sailors and crew and pirates who are on board the ships. A lot of times they were employed as the cooks or doing, you know, as servants. It's there's really there's really no consistent approach to black men under the black flag, as Ken Kinker wrote about years and years ago. Um, you know, I, I keep saying someday, wouldn't it be great if we get, you know, a, a, a diary from a, an African pirate, you know, detailing everything that we would love to know about these men. Uh, but until that sort of evidence shows up, you know, we really, we have to extrapolate what their lives, what the attitudes towards them was like from a lot of the other pirates. And so I think this, this uh, I think, helps sort of lead us into, as we uh, progress here, to sort of talk about the consequences and impact. Obviously, all three of you have discussed that uh, throughout the panel here. But sort of specifically, I just want to pose the question of, you know, did the example of the pirates, their existence, the, the mythology around them that started to form even during their time, did it change colonial society or policy in any notable or significant way? I know we sort of talked about perhaps this in the context of our last question, but we can expand on that or in different areas about the way piracy actually changed colonial society and, and policy. Well, I think one of the big things, the way that piracy had a big impact on um, colonial society was uh, legally. Um, and again, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about how a lot of the colonies, particularly in the South and in the Caribbean, had to alter their own legal systems to match exactly how it was done in Britain in order to persecute piracy. And also a lot of colonists were told that if they were going to collude with pirates, they themselves could be counted as pirates and arrested as such. And so this caused kind of a really big complex issue going on because there were a lot of colonists who really did depend on piracy. Um, pirates in some places were valued members of their community. Um, many families were often ostracized or put into destitution if their husbands, I'm just generalizing here, if their husbands were perhaps found guilty and executed. So this had kind of a big impact on a lot of local communities, particularly in uh, North America, which were also maritime, where, where most were just so maritime based. But there was also kind of, the, there was a bit of a dissatisfaction amongst a lot of colonists and even governors when they had to change their own laws and their own court system because they felt that their stuff was being infringed upon. Like how could we have um, our courts done exactly as in England when it doesn't fit the context of our colony? And so this was causing a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Um, and also the trading that colonists had to do with pirates that became even more and more and more restricted uh, was causing prices to rise and it was causing more complications for the merchants. There were just, it, it's such an interesting kind of symbiotic relationship that we see with pirates and also the public. And the public is just also so fascinated with pirates at the same time. Again, 
because socially they couldn't move around, but they saw pirates as people who were able to cast off society and kind of become their own nation, which is how pirates referred to themselves. People are reading about them. Trials were being published pretty much verbatim, newspaper articles, speeches, observations, Cotton Mather's sermons. People were just voraciously reading about them. And so piracy really kind of permeated into society, I think a lot more than people think. It's also to a great extent, the money of the merchants, which influences government policy, which influences the imperial authority, the sort of crackdown on pirates. You know, back when old Harry Morgan, Henry Morgan is able to attack Panama, you know, he's arrested, but you know, he returns to the Caribbean with a knighthood because he had attacked the old enemy, Spain, at a time when Britain needed this sort of upstart hero. And with Captain Kidd, the, the reputation he developed, he was a bit of a bungler, um, but he was threatening the, the commerce of the East India Company. They were the ones putting pressure on the authorities to hunt Kidd down, to arrest him, to make a show, to show you know, the Mughal court back in India that yes, we are cracking down on these pirates. So, you know, when the act for the more effectual suppression of piracy, 11 and 12 William III comes out, you know, and Quelch is the first one to be tried outside of Britain. These are vice admiralty courts. These are prerogative courts. These are courts without juries, which, you know, for New York, for Boston, for Charleston, for Philadelphia, for uh, Port Royal Jamaica, this is a real crackdown um, by you know the laws of trade by imperial authorities on these sort of freewheeling pirates. So, like Megan had mentioned earlier, you know where once they were bringing in hard cash or luxury goods, you know, sort of quietly and clandestinely, suddenly they are being hunted down and you know executed, made spectacles of, which you know just sort of adds to that fascination off of that, that sort of crackdown ends up coming, you know, those same forces that were causing a lot of small businessmen, right, to turn to piracy, those same forces are sort of what end up closing off what we would consider the golden age of piracy, too. It's this, this push for this treasure spot, and then this treasure spot, and then this treasure spot that ultimately is one of the forces that kind of starts to shut down the so-called golden age of piracy, because eventually the attacks on things like the East India Company end up upsetting British corporations so much that they pour a lot of money and anger in. And it really starts this crackdown because you end up doing too many bad things to the wrong people. You upset the wrong people. And at the same time, as you start having more peacetime trade, as you have more and more peace trees starting to go out, so you have less privateers, thus more pirates, and you have less need to have these, these sort of, oh, well, it was a casualty of war moments, then you end up having a lot of unemployed but heavily trained sea folk, right? And initially you get a short rise in piracy, but quickly a bunch of navies figure out that this isn't great, and so they start hiring them. And so now you have these incredibly bolstered navies and pissed off corporations. And this means that it all of a sudden becomes incredibly difficult to be a pirate because as we said right back in the very beginning, piracy flourishes when places are not well patrolled. So if you increase the number of patrols and you start even having these sort of merchant marines patrolling where the East India Company is sending its own people out. They're like, wow, if, if the Navy can't protect it, forget it, we're gonna do it on our own. You've pissed off the wrong company. The number of piracy goes down and the charges get worse. Instead of sort of one person being hanged and everyone else getting kind of a, a slap on the wrist, you're now executing the entire crew publicly. And they make these really big scenes out of it. All of a sudden people are like, well, I, I don't know actually maybe being in the Navy and only kind of hating my life is better than being very dead. And so it really starts to have this strong effect. Thank you all. Uh, again, there, there are a few questions. We got a few minutes left here. So I wanna to try to maybe do 
uh, as much of a lightning round perhaps as we can here and, and answer some of the questions that have been filtering through the chat. And I know that our panels have been uh, great as well about responding to some of these here, but just to sort of maybe get it uh, uh, on the record here, if there was maybe a, um, there was a single book that you would suggest for our audience to read to get a handle, either an introduction or something more specific, what would be maybe one title that each of you might suggest uh, for folks to read after this? So one book I always recommend is um, Mark Hanna's book, Pirate Nest and the Rise of the British Empire. Um, I, it's, it was published in 2015. And what I really like about it is that I think it's like the first really deep in-depth study to kind of really show the impact that pirates had not just on sea, but really on land and the development of the empire in, um, in the Americas and the Caribbean and further afield as well. Um, so I think the book is, is really, really brilliant. It's a bit dense, but it's also quite accessible. So um, yeah, in my opinion, I think it's one of the best ones that's been published in recent years. If I can sort of cheat ever so slightly and answer the best book on pirate history, but then also one on archeology, span I would love to, if I promise to be quick. Um, for history, I still always stand by David Cordingley's Under the Black Flag. Um, and just because I knew people would ask, I have it here. Um, so, and mine's very battered. Your copy doesn't have to be. Uh, but then for archaeology, there's a phenomenal series put out by University Press of Florida. Uh, and it started uh, with this one here, X Marks the Spot, uh, which is the Archaeology of Piracy. And then they did Pieces of Eight, which is the second one. And the third one is coming out um, in the beginning of next year. And I've actually got a chapter in it. Yay! Um, anyway, it's called Dead Men's Chest. And so if you guys like them, we're going to keep putting them out. So there you go. Told you I'd be fast. The other great uh, secondary source that I always had the students read was Villains of All Nations by Marcus Redeker, in which he sort of fleshed out all of his ideas uh, from his initial article back in the 1980s. But I always like going back to the primary sources. Um, Esquemelon's Buccaneers of America is a fantastic read. Uh, so you know, so much information. And then, of course, there's Captain Johnson's General History of the Pirates, which is maddeningly detailed. And you know, you can spend a whole career just going through what's real and what's not in that. Um, you know, the the two volumes, all the stories of the great pirates in there. And sort of in the same vein, uh, another sort of lightning round one here, if there were, uh, if you would recommend uh, a movie or a television show, uh, a drama, sort of a kind of maybe not fully fictionalized, but based on it, that maybe captures as, as best as you all understand that life uh, under the black flag, uh, what, what TV show or movie might you recommend for folks as well? Black sales, hands down in terms of fiction. That's the one I recommend the most. They include lots of real historical figures. Um, yes, they do mess up the timeline and they have historical figures existing in the same time when they actually didn't, but I think they're very authentic in terms of the history behind those characters. That's done very well. It also goes into kind of politics on pirate ships amongst pirates and also with those on land and kind of shows like the corruption that happens between authorities and pirates, those who supported pirates, those who persecuted them. Um, I thought it would, it's also got really great representation showing the diversity of a pirate ship. So hands down in terms of fiction, that's the one I recommend all day, every day. Go ahead, Steven, I can wait. I'm gonna go old school, Captain Blood, the old Errol Flynn from 1936. Um, that was the first pirate movie I ever remember seeing scared the life out of me. I think I was about five years old. Um, but the, it's, it's a really sort of interesting depiction, not only of the politics of the era, but also reasons for turning to piracy, uh, the slave economy of the Caribbean, uh, the, the um, camaraderie and contentiousness between English and French buccaneers of the 17th century. Um, so my vote is Captain Blood. I find myself conflicted. Um, <laughs> part of me actually really likes the Our Flag Means Death because of a lot of the portrayals of the, the culture conflict, a lot of the portrayals that show uh, that, that there's these, these class conflicts within the culture and 
a lot of the hints toward metallotage, which often gets left out of pirate movies, that it's it's all about lots of, of manly swashbuckling, right? Um, and and that's not necessarily the way things went. Um, and so I, I really quite appreciate that one. Maybe I'll leave it there to keep things short. And if if I I certainly know I'm not as uh, as esteemed as our panelists, but if I may make a recommendation as well, I, I think Muppet Treasure Island would be a solid one as well. It really speaks to the uh, the heavy uh, utilization of felt in pirate culture that I think gets often overlooked uh, in the scholarship. Uh, and on you that note, Muppet Treasure Island just made my day. Well, I'm I'm very happy to hear that. Megan. That is my wife's favorite. Uh, on, on, on that note, just taking a look at our uh, time, it, we are approaching uh, the end of our time here with our panelists. I would just like to thank Megan and Stephen and Rebecca one more time uh, for uh, taking time out of their day to, to speak with all of us and share their expertise, their insights, uh, their knowledge here on this subject. So thank, uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you.